This is Historical Hotties, a podcast where we go through different categories of historical figure and try and figure out which one is the biggest babe. Welcome, everybody, to our new episode of Historical Hotties, a show where me, Lindsay Nelson, and the woman who conquered Librarian Chic ages ago and has moved on to new frontiers, Whitney Nelson. And what we do on this show is we pick a category, a type of historical person, and then we both put forward our argument for who is the hottest historical person in that category. And then after we introduce our pick, we rate their merits on a scale of one to five in four categories. Physical attractiveness, mental attractiveness, social impact, and je ne sais quoi. So Whitney, our category this week is detectives. Who is your pick? Come with me on a journey. Picture in your mind's eye. He enthralled Victorian England with his unrivaled skill at cracking cases based on astute logical reasoning and his grasp of forensic science, not to mention a mastery of disguises and an encyclopedic knowledge of the criminal underclass. But this is not Sherlock Holmes that we're talking about. Right, because this is non-fictional people. (laughs) This is Jerome Caminata, who is purported by a historian to have been the person that inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's hero. So he was born in, and I don't know if I'm saying the last name correctly, but Caminata was born in Deansgate, Manchester in 1844 to an Irish mother and an Italian father. Deansgate in Manchester at the time was kind of the heart of Victorian crime world because urban life in Victorian England in Deansgate was fairly deadly. It was poor quality housing for laboring mill workers was the primary, like, residences. There was inadequate water supplies, there was no sanitation, and then there was a bunch of public houses and brothels, which led to rampant typhus, influenza, cholera, etc. And it was all tightly packed tenements for everyone that was not working illegally. They were all poor mill workers, so they were cramming a bunch of people into very small places. In 1842, just before the birth of Jerome Caminata, the life expectancy of the average worker in that area was 18 years. So that kind of puts it in perspective for you how shitty it was <laughs> to live in Deansgate, Manchester. So he joined the Manchester City Police Force and his first 14 hours on the beat saw him really testing his stamina and his resolve to be a police officer right off the bat because he was beaten pretty brutally just for being a police constable amongst the poverty and criminals. But having grown up in the neighborhood that he grew up in, he was pretty comfortable in rough neighborhoods, hanging out with criminals, shadowing people, And he used this to really kind of leverage himself as a police officer and start solving crimes, even in his free time. And when you start to research him, you find a lot of great slang of the time, like pickpockets being called dippers, and the gangs of street fighters were called scuttlers, but they all sort of quickly became part of his informant ring and were also the people that he was taking down at the same time. Eventually, he moved up from sort of walking a street beat to aristocratic, sophisticated swindlers and high-end Victorian crime. But he started with the lowest of the low lives, and a lot of them were neighbors. So in 1888, his reputation for policing was far preceding him, and he earned a promotion to inspector. Apparently, he was reportedly responsible for the imprisonment of 1,225 criminals and for the closure of 400 public houses which at the time, that's a pretty hefty record for someone who's walking around on foot catching these people. So threats on his life became more commonplace as he got more and more popular and he always carried a pistol and he was not afraid to use it. He would shoot first and ask questions later. But he was also known as being eccentric for his policing style even at the time, let alone modern policing standards now. His most often used trick in his bag of tricks was dressing in disguise to gather evidence on people. His skill with disguises was so renowned that apparently once while tracking a group of thieves, he dressed as a laborer. 
his own chief constable didn't recognize him. That's how able he was to disappear seamlessly. His boss did not recognize him while he was at work. Using all of these disguises and being this shapeless, formless person who could be anywhere at any time, he grew a pretty huge network of underworld informers. And apparently he always met them at the same place. It was the back pew of St. Mary's Church, which was also known as the Hidden Gem. And he would always meet them in the back pew of the church for all of his informants. And apparently he could spot a thief by the way that they walked, uh, which was apparently the result of visits to prisons. And he watched inmates walk around the yard to familiarize himself with their appearances and their gait and their mannerisms. But shortly thereafter, apparently those methods were effective because he was made detective superintendent really, really quickly. More quickly than anyone at the time really had a career record for. Uh, He started to become a national figure right at the time that Sherlock Holmes was being created. He was in newspapers and in stories about nine months to a year before Sherlock Holmes started being a character and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle started putting out books. So he rose to prominence right as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle started writing and putting out stuff about Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, that's interesting because I always heard that uh, Dr. Joseph Bell was Arthur Conan Doyle's inspiration for Sherlock, but it definitely sounds like it could have been a combination of this guy and... I'm sure that to create the world's greatest detective in stories, you take from a bunch of different sources, Mm -hmm. but, and I'll get into it a little bit more later. I have more information to give you. I'll dribble it out as we go along. Well, certainly the master of disguising and the comfort with any social class. Yeah, but there's there's some more that leads credence to this theory. (laughs) uh, It's your turn now. All right, so for my detective, we are going to take a little trip across the pond and talk about Kate Warren, the first female private eye in American history. So Kate was born in upstate New York in 1856. Not a lot is known about her early life, but she became a widow young at 23, and she headed into the city to find work. And at the time, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, one of the first detective agencies in America, was hiring. And Kate Kate came in and started talking with Alan Pinkerton, and he thought she was there for a secretarial position, and it took him till about halfway through the conversation that he realized she was applying for a detective position. (laughs) Um, And she walked in apparently very confident and decisive in her argument, and she made a very compelling argument that women could be most useful in worming out secrets in many places which would be impossible for a male detective to operate. A woman would be able to befriend the wives and girlfriends of suspected criminals and gain their confidence. Men become braggarts when they are around women who encourage them to boast. And Kate also noted women have an eye for detail and are excellent observers. Alan Pinkerton was so impressed by her arguments that he hired her as the first female detective and certainly the first in his agency but as far as we know the first professional female detective. He soon had a chance to put her skills to the test in a case of the Adams Express Company embezzlement was her first assignment and she was successfully able to bring herself into the confidence of the wife of the prime suspect Mr. Baroni and she thereby acquired valuable evidence leading to the husband's conviction and was able to recover of the $50,000 that he stole was able to recover $39,515 not too shabby not too shabby so her first case was a success in fact every recorded case that we have of hers she successfully Successfully solved. There's a lot of information we don't have about her career because the Pinkerton office burned in the Great Chicago Fire and all of their documented files disappeared. But one of the most famous cases she was involved in is the Baltimore plot. Now, this happened in 1861, and it was when Lincoln was the president-elect but was not yet sworn into office. And he was doing a train tour to go to Washington to be sworn into office, mm-hmm. stopping in multiple cities and giving talks and stuff on his way. And there was some railroad protests happening at the time of people who were mad at the railroad companies breaking up tracks so trains couldn't run. So Lincoln's office hired the Pinkertons to check out the route that he was going to be taking. I feel like this sounds really familiar. This is her most famous case, so I wouldn't be surprised if you'd heard about it. When you started talking about her, I didn't know anything about her. Uh, It didn't sound familiar, but now all of a sudden I'm like, 
wait, I think I've heard this story, so continue. So yeah, so they were supposed to check out if there was any plans to break up any tracks, if there would be delays in getting to Washington. But Kate went undercover as Kate Cherry, a southern belle, and started mixing in some Baltimore society, and found out that not only were there railroad plots, but also an assassination plot on Lincoln's life. That if he stopped in Baltimore, they were planning on killing him between two tracks that went, you know, different lengths of the train. There was a couple blocks walk that you had to go to continue on through Baltimore. You had to get off at one station, walk a couple blocks, and switch to another station. And there was a plan to start a fight at one end of the alley to block it off and distract Lincoln's security. And then other people would attack and stab Lincoln while the fight was distracting people. And this was actually a plot inspired by the supposed assassination of Caesar. And <laughs> they set that up, so they were going to try and make that happen again. And Kate discovered information of this in her undercover work in Baltimore and brought it to the Pinkerton Agency and to Lincoln's security forces. And Lincoln said he wasn't going to stop or cancel any of his talks because he didn't want anybody to feel like he was neglecting them. So they had to get him through Baltimore without giving them an opportunity for assassination attempts. So they rescheduled his train. I mean, they didn't publicly, but they booked a different train. They cleared all the tracks. They stuck a Pinkerton agent at every switch of the tracks with lanterns. And they were to signal as the train was approaching if there was any trouble ahead on the tracks. And if there were, the train would stop. And if there wasn't, they'd go ahead. They got into Baltimore late at night. And Kate dressed Lincoln up as her invalid brother. She put a knit cap on his head and a shawl over his shoulders and got rid of his trademark stovepipe hat and <laughs> rented a train car for her family, like her and her brother, and stayed up watching him all night, which supposedly she never slept. And Pinkerton made the slogan of the agency after that, We Never Sleep, and their logo was an eye, an ever-watching eye, and people are pretty sure that that's where the term private eye came from. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> was the Pinkerton agency's ever-watchful, never-sleeping eye that was inspired by Kate's vigilant guard of Lincoln through that night. So they ended up, to get through Baltimore without attracting attention, hooked up the train car to horses so that nobody would hear it going through Baltimore, stuck him through in the dead of night, and got him safely out with no assassination attempts. So that's probably one of her most famous exploits. Because the Pinkerton agency so earned the trust of Lincoln, they became a military intelligence unit during the Civil War, which Kate was heavily involved in. And she worked as a spy, pretending to be Alan Pinkerton's wife, but also also sometimes supposedly dressing as a Union or Confederate soldier. And the only picture in existence that people think might be Kate Warren is actually her in uniform as a Union soldier. It's like a young man. They think that that actually might be her and may be the only picture in existence of her. Pickerton trusted her so much he had her start and head a whole female division of his detective agency. And so that is my pick for hottest detective. Okay, so let's get into the categories. I mean, I feel like for both of these, mental attractiveness is kind of like obf. A gimme? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, they're brilliant. I mean, they're known for yep. cunning and analytics and being intuitive, but also being very, you know, aware of their surroundings and perceptive. And mm -hmm. I feel like for both of these, we pretty much already covered mental attractiveness. I think that's true. And I think that we can safely say that these are both the underwear models of <laughs> mental attractiveness. <laughs> I mean, okay, <laughs> sure, yeah, let's say that. I like it. I like an analytical mind. Why not? Let's say they're the <laughs> underwear models of mental attractiveness. Yeah, it's good. We should make it a thing. That sounds great to me. <laughs> I'm printing bumper stickers as we speak. I'm making t-shirts, so we're all set. <laughs> all right, so I'm assuming that means fives for you for both. I will give both of those fives. They sound like fascinating people. Very mentally attractive. I am also giving both of them fives. Excellent. Okay, so <laughs> physical attractiveness. Go. There aren't, like I said, any pictures that we for sure know, either like photographic or portraiture, that are attributed to her. Alan Pinkerton wrote a book about the early days of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, and he described his first impression of her by saying, She's a commanding person with clear-cut, expressive features. She was a slender, brown-haired woman, graceful in her movements and self-possessed. Her features, although not what could be called handsome, were decidedly of an intellectual cast. 
Her face was honest, which would cause one in distress instinctively to select her as a confidant. So, she sounds like a very interesting person, and he talks about her being graceful and slender. She had ease fitting into different societal roles and gaining people's trust. He does say she is not what anyone would describe handsome, but has like an intelligent sort of forceful cast to her features. So I would say it sounds like probably a three. Somebody who's nice looking, but unassuming looking, which helps with fitting into a bunch of different roles. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, since, you know, that's the only information we have to go off of, I'm probably going to say three also. Yeah. Definitely not unattractive, and attractive parts about her, but not classically beautiful. Yeah. So, for Jerome Caminata... Which is such a great name, by the way. It is. It is a great name. There's really only one headshot portrait photograph that I found when I was doing research. From that, you can definitely see very kind eyes, a very nice, large, but sort of chiseled and well-proportioned nose, and a very manly beard (laughs) with a good, solid jaw. So all of those proportions work very well. He does have a very big forehead, which is probably due to hair loss question mark yeah very big forehead a little on the like stocky side he looks tall in the photograph but no one ever talked about how tall he was and for him to be able to fit into so many different costumes and walks of life he can't have been giant he just has a tall presence in the photograph but compared to other real life detectives one might consider for this podcast and possibly if you were reading a lot about detectives when doing research (laughs) in order to choose one's hottie one might have noticed that he's about 30 times more attractive than most of them and about 50 times less Theodore (laughs) Roosevelt-y. So you want us to grade on a bell curve, a (laughs) detective-specific bell curve, is what you're saying. Well, I just, you know, they all seem very either old and gangly skeleton-like or very, like, rotund yet sturdy with lots of push-broom bristle-type mustaches and whatnot. So while I don't necessarily want to judge on a curve, I do think that there's a little bit of influence for me in that he was far and away, in my research, the most attractive man out of all of the famous detectives who have accomplished something in history. So I would probably put him... I don't know, 3.5, 4? He's nice looking. He's not super attractive, so I feel maybe more on the like 3.5, 3 area. But he's nicer looking than average, in my opinion, especially of the time. Victorian England was not overrun with hotties. (laughs) Don't let the Victorians hear you say that. I mean, I think that he's similar to Kate. He gives me the impression that he's nice, he's pleasant looking, but he's unassuming, you know. Which I would definitely say falls into a three. Definitely, beardiness is not super my type. Okay, so, social impact. Kate's social impact was pretty huge. If we count that she probably was instrumental in keeping Lincoln alive long enough to be president. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's a pretty big one. (laughs) So, she was also, like I said, active in military intelligence during the Civil War, helping us win that, probably. But I think one of the most important things about her social impact, Alan Pinkerton named Kate Warren one of the five best detectives that he ever worked with, and that included all of the male detectives that he worked with. He helped her to start up a whole female investigator division and until 1891 no women were even allowed on the police force in any capacity the first woman detective was not installed until 1903 in the police force and i just think she was a real trailblazer for women's work in law enforcement and how she was like look with only 50 percent of the population being detectives you are missing out on access to a bunch of places totally where men are not easily infiltrated So I think she's a four on social impact. Okay. So I'll agree. That sounds about right to me. Sounds like a good social impact. She sounds cool. And also it doesn't seem to be, you know, we talk about a lot of women who do crazy stuff and put themselves into a male dominated world. We've talked about it more than once on this podcast, but she seems to just have very quietly and non-confrontationally talked her way into it with reason, which is great. So we'll talk about mine now. So Jerome, full disclosure, the biography that was written by the historian 
about kind of outing this detective. He's famous. He's very well known and was before this book came out. But this biography that was written by Angela Buckley that outs him as Sherlock Holmes' inspiration, I have not read. It used the detective's own accounts from notes and journals. It used a bunch of newspaper articles, social commentary on the crime and poverty. It used a lot of historical basis, but it is still, you know, as much as she may be a scientist putting out historical facts. We don't know for a fact who was inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, or if there were 15 detectives. I will say that looking into the book, each chapter has titles like Hotbed of Social Iniquity and Vice, or Rascality, Rapacity, and Roguery, or Gin Palaces, Gambling Dens, and a Cross-Dressing Ball. So I definitely (laughs) will read this book now that I've looked into it, but not having read it, if as much of his life lines up to be the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes as it appears from my research because I looked up, you know, several other sources, biographies that were written previous to this book coming out and and all of that. Um, He really does seem to be it looks like a pretty good bet that he's the main inspiration for Sherlock Holmes. So you can, you know, you can thank this guy for Benedict Cumberbatch as well as how many movies and TV shows and radio plays and, you know, Sherlock Holmes has been a staple of entertainment since the books first came out. Even as books in the time, they were hugely popular. So ever since then, Sherlock Holmes is all over the place. So as far as social impact goes, being that this guy looks so much to be the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes, I'm going to say a pretty big social impact. I don't think I'm going to say five because I don't think he drastically changed the forefront of science or police work. Work. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like he revolutionized methods for anyone other than himself. Right, yeah, no one really adopted his strategy other than Jerome the dude. So, I'm going to say four, I think, because Sherlock Holmes is a pretty oddball character that you haven't really seen anywhere else, but he has been so popular and so ubiquitous that it's a pretty big social impact on entertainment and storytelling. I don't know, because Arthur Conan Doyle has attributed Dr. Joseph Bell, who was his mentor, But it definitely sounds like this guy rose to popularity in the culture about nine months before he started writing. And clearly has a lot of Sherlock Holmesian tendencies in him. Could definitely get the argument that he's a major inspiration for the character. I'm going to go with, if we're getting into half stars, which is like a three and a half, because it doesn't sound like he shared his methods a lot. It sounded like he's an incredible story and did incredible work personally, and definitely the Sherlock Holmes character has had huge resonance in culture, but he didn't affect a lot of change around him, Mm -hmm. you know, at the time, it doesn't seem like. So, I'm going to say 3.5. Okay, so, for je ne sais quoi, I have two facts. One fact is that he formed a nemesis during his time as a detective called (laughs) Bob Horridge, who is a violent career criminal with a background in mathematical sciences, who, strangely enough, has a number of similarities with Sherlock Holmes's arch enemy, Professor James Moriarty, who was a mathematics professor turned criminal. That does sound very Moriarty. They had a 20 year feud. <laughs> Did one of them fall off a waterfall? Uh, no, it ended up being that Caminata and Horridge like skirmished in a final dramatic confrontation, and Caminata managed to pull out his revolver just a second faster than his enemy. So it really came down to who was the faster draw between the two of of them. It did not end at a waterfall. So that's fact one about je ne sais quoi. Fact number two for je ne sais quoi is that in his career, Jerome Caminata tracked down a woman named Alicia Ormond, who was a seemingly well-educated woman with an aristocratic background and expensive tastes, who is actually a consummate forger, an experienced crook who was wanted across the nation for a string of frauds and thefts in high society. And he tracked her down and arrested her, but then a apparently became captivated with her and formed a sort of obsession slash relationship a la Sherlock Holmes' fascination with Irene Adler. If that's not je ne sais quoi, I don't know what is. (laughs) It's interesting that Irene Adler has come up a couple of times over the course of our episodes. I find that very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That sounds very je ne sais quoi-y. And I would say 
that that definitely feels like you didn't give an actual rating for him, but I'm assuming you're going for a five. Oh, I, I rate five for that. I feel like that's a lot of je ne sais quoi. First of all, anyone having a dramatic confrontation with your 20-year enemy, that's a lot of je ne sais quoi. But also having this sort of will they, won't they attracted, but also I'm going to arrest you because you're a criminal thing with a woman. Very sexy. Yeah, who's full of fraud and theft in high society. I think that's sexy and, and quite a bit of je ne sais quoi. So I vote five. There's definitely a lot of theatricality to this man's life, which I think warrants. There is. Which, for someone who is so able to slip into different roles and become unassuming, it's very interesting how theatrical his life seems to be, or at least his behaviors. I would say that that warrants a five in je ne sais quoi. I'll agree with that. So one of the things that I find so attractive about Kate in talking about je ne sais quoi is something you kind of touched on a little earlier, is the way that we've talked about a lot of women who've really defied social standards of their time. The thing that I like about Kate is the way she seems to so easily sidestep them. Instead of loudly confronting them, she's just like, I know what I can do. I'm just going to do it. She's very assertive and confident, but in this real laid back, assured, cool kind of way. And 16 aliases over the course of her career. So you gotta like somebody with 16 aliases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just like the cool confidence that she has. I think it's very attractive and je ne sais quoi and to d do all this dashing stuff and do it in such a relaxed manner. So I definitely give her a four in je ne sais quoi. I would agree with that. I agree. So, what are our totals? Okay, our totals are, with a score of 34 to 32, mm, close one. Jerome Caminata is the winner. Ah, well, it is a man's world, after all. <laughs> no, we try so hard to make it not a man's world in the historical hottie podcast. I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> But alas, this time, Jerome Caminata is the winner. Listeners, we appreciate you joining us, and please let us know if you think that someone else was the winner. Yeah. Are there any hot detectives that we missed? Real ones. <laughs> and <laughs> that's all. Bye. Bye. This is Whitney. I just wanted to pop in real quick and say thank you so much to everybody for all the love. We're just getting started, but it really means a lot to us that everyone subscribed so quickly and got in there and listened to it. And if you haven't already, I just wanted to put in a quick call to action. Uh, if you could please rate us on iTunes and leave a comment, we would super appreciate that. That'll really help us get out there to people who haven't found us yet. Thanks. Bye.